Welcome to the Joe Rogan podcast. No, it's not. It's not. I know. I know. Okay, it's just it's just real Steve TV. Sorry. I know I kind of look like Joe Rogan, but my bad. My bad. It is Bible study time, ladies and gentlemen, where we give you the straight dope. Worst tagline ever for a Bible study. Yeah, maybe don't say that. And we're going to jump to the book of Esther. So um, in a very interesting story about a king, a queen, a poor Jew. Well, I don't know if he was poor. And a guy who hates Jews. Boom. There you go. And uh, once we get started, I'm going to play like a short video that this uh, ministry that I really love called The Bible Project. Shout out to The Bible Project. You can find their stuff online. They have a ministry. You can find their stuff on YouTube and they have, um, you can find their podcast on like wherever podcasts are sold. Father, thank you for this night and thank you for another opportunity to get online and share the wor word of God and do a live online Twitch Bible study. Um, something I thought I would never be doing Lord, but um, I'm very excited to do it. And I just ask for your presence, Lord, um, in this Bible study, Lord, please, please come to us, to me, whoever may hear or see this, Lord, please minister to all of us. P please open our eyes and our ears, open our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears to the truth and let us see what you have to show us, God, from the Bible. And again, Lord, just minister to us. Wherever we're at in our lives, God, whether we we're going through a good time or a bad time, a neutral time, whether we're experiencing failure and defeat, whether we're experience, experiencing success and victory, wherever we're at, Lord, come to us um, and minister to us and, and speak life into our lives, Lord God. Feed us spiritually tonight, Lord, and, uh, and guide this, Lord. Holy Spirit, please be here and guide this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll be mostly in the book of Esther, so I'm going to play this video that is basically what, it's a nine-minute video that gives just a, a, a synopsis or overall summary, um, like the cliff notes, if you will, uh, of the book of Esther. The book of Esther, it's one of the more exciting and curious books in the Bible. The story is set over 100 years after the Babylonian exile of the Israelites from their land. And while some Jews did return to Jerusalem, remember Ezra and Nehemiah, many did not. And so the book of Esther is about a Jewish community living in Susa, the capital city of the ancient Persian Empire. And the main characters in this story are two Jews, Mordecai and then his niece Esther. And then there's the king of Persia, who's something of a drunken pushover in this story. And then there's the Persian official Haman, the cunning villain. Now this is a curious book in the Bible, mainly for the fact that God is never even mentioned, not once. Which might strike you as kind of odd. I mean, isn't the Bible about God? But this is a brilliant technique by the author, who's anonymous, by the way. It's an invitation to read this story looking for God's activity, and there are signs of it everywhere. The story is full of very odd, quote, coincidences and ironic reversals, and it all forces you to see God's purpose at work, but behind the scenes. Let's just dive into the story. The book opens with the king of Persia throwing two elaborate banquet feasts that last a total of 187 days. And it's all for the grandiose purpose of displaying his greatness and splendor. On the last day of the banquet feast, he's really drunk, and he demands that his wife, Queen Vashti, appear at the party to show off her beauty. She refuses, and so in a drunken rage, the king deposes Vashti and makes the silly decree that all Persian men should now be the masters of their own homes. Then he holds a beauty pageant because he wants to find a new queen. This is like a really bad soap opera. But it's right here that we're introduced to Esther and Mordecai. Esther hides her Jewish identity and enters the beauty pageant and wins. And the king is so obsessed with Esther that he elevates her to become the new queen of Persia. Now after this, and even more serendipitous, is the fact that Mordecai just happens to overhear two royal guards plotting to murder the king. And so he informs Esther, who in turn informs the king, and Mordecai gets credit for saving the king's life. 
Now, right here from the beginning, God's not mentioned anywhere, but this all seems providentially ordered. What is it that God's up to? You have to keep reading. We're next introduced to Haman, who's not actually a Persian. He's called an Agagite. He's a descendant of the ancient Canaanites. Remember 1 Samuel chapter 15. The king elevates Haman to the highest position in the kingdom, and he demands that everybody kneel before Haman. Well, when Mordecai sees Haman, he refuses to kneel, which of course fills Haman with rage. And when he finds out that Mordecai's Jewish, Haman successfully persuades the king to enact this crazy decree to destroy all of the Jewish people. And to decide the date of the Jews' annihilation, Haman rolls the dice. A die is called pur in Hebrew. Tuck that away for later. Eleven months later, on the 13th of Adar, all the Jews will die. Haman and the king then have a drinking banquet to celebrate their really horrible decision. So the focus now turns to Mordecai and Esther, who are the only hope for the Jewish people. They make a plan that Esther is going to reveal her Jewish identity to the king and ask him to reverse the decree. But approaching the king without a royal request is, according to Persian law, an act worthy of death. So in a key statement, Mordecai, he's confident that even if Esther remains silent, that deliverance for the Jews will arrive from another place. And then Mordecai wonders aloud. He says, who knows? Maybe you've become queen for this very moment. Esther responds with bravery, and she purposes to go to the king with her amazing words, if I perish, I perish. Now, in what unfolds, we watch the ironic reversal of all of Haman's evil plans. So Esther hosts the king and Haman at a first banquet, and she says that she wants to make a special request of both of them at an exclusive banquet the following day. So Haman leaves the banquet totally drunk, and he sees Mordecai in the street. He fumes with anger, and he orders that a tall stake be built so that Mordecai can be impaled upon it in the morning. It seems like things can't get any worse for the Jews and for Mordecai. But all of a sudden, the story pivots. It just so happens that night, the king, he can't sleep. And he has the royal chronicles read to him for good bedtime reading. And he just happens to hear about how Mordecai had saved the king's life. He had totally forgotten. So in the morning, Haman enters to request Mordecai's execution. And the king in that moment orders Haman to honor Mordecai publicly for saving his life. So now Haman has to lead Mordecai around the city on a royal horse, telling everyone to praise him. Now this moment in the story, it's a pivot for the whole book. It begins Haman's downfall and Mordecai's rise to power. Watch how this works. The day after is Esther's second banquet. So the king and Haman arrive and Esther informs the king that first of all she's Jewish and second that Haman has enacted a decree to murder her and to murder Mordecai who saved his life and to murder all of the Jews. Now the king's had a lot to drink so when he hears this news he goes into yet one more drunken rage, and he orders that Haman be impaled on the very stake he made for Mordecai. It's ironic and a grisly way for Haman to go. Haman's execution, however, doesn't solve the problem of the decree to kill all of the Jews. So the focus now turns to Esther and Mordecai as they make a plan to reverse the decree. They discover that the king can't revoke a decree that he's already made. So instead, the king commissions Mordecai to issue a counter decree. On the appointed day that all of the Jews were supposed to be killed, the 13th of Adar, now the Jews are ordered to defend themselves and to destroy any who plotted to kill them. Then Mordecai, Esther, and Jews everywhere hold banquets and feasts to celebrate this new decree, and Mordecai is elevated to a seat beside the king. Eventually, the decreed day comes, and the Jews triumph over their enemies. First, they destroy Haman's family, and then any other Persian officials who had joined in Haman's plot. And then on a second day, they get permission to destroy any who plotted against them throughout the entire kingdom. This results in joy and celebration as the Jews are rescued from annihilation. The story then tells about how Esther and Mordecai established by decree this annual two-day feast of Purim to commemorate their deliverance from destruction. And the name of the feast comes from Haman's dice. Remember, Purim. The book concludes with a short epilogue as Mordecai is elevated to second in command in the kingdom and we are told now of his royal greatness and splendor as the Jews thrive in exile. Now, step back. 
Notice how this whole story has been designed. The story was full of moments of ironic reversal, but we can now see the whole story is structured as an ironic reversal, right down to the details. So the king's splendor and feasts and decrees are mirrored by Mordecai's splendor and feasts and decrees at the end. Esther and Mordecai, they first saved the king, but now in the end they save all of the Jews. Then you have Haman's elevation and edicts and banquet that gets reversed by Mordecai's elevation and edict and banquet. And then at the center you have Esther and Mordecai's planning scenes, and then Esther's two banquets that act as a frame around the greatest moment of reversal in the whole story, Haman's humiliation and Mordecai's exaltation. Beautiful. Another fascinating feature of this book is the moral ambiguity of the characters. There's a lot of drinking and anger and sex and murder, of which Mordecai and Esther are a part. Not to mention their violation of many commands in the Torah, like marrying Gentiles or eating impure foods. And so the story is not putting Mordecai and Esther forward as moral example as if it endorses all of their behavior. But they are put forward as models of trust and hope when things get really bad. And so the book of Esther comes back to that question with which we begin, why God is not mentioned. The message of this book seems to be that when God seems absent, when his people are in exile, when they're unfaithful to the Torah, does this mean that God is done with Israel? Has God abandoned his promises? And the book of Esther says, no. It invites us to see that God can and does work in the real mess and moral ambiguity of human history. And he uses the faithfulness of even morally compromised people to accomplish his purposes. And so the book of Esther asks us to be willing to trust God's providence even when we can't see it working. And to hope that no matter how bad things get, God is committed to redeeming his world. And that's what the book of Esther is all about. We're going to touch on two things through this story, um, but it's the modern framing of Israel and Palestine slash God will turn our situation around. That's what I um, titled the notes for this Bible study. But we're going to go to the book of Esther, and I want to start off with Esther 3, 1 through 8. Okay. After these things, King Esaris promoted Haman, the Ag Agag Agagite the son of Hamadetha, I'm going to butcher some of this, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them, they told Haman, in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So, as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Assyrus. Haman was appointed by the king in this story um, as a powerful man. And Mordecai is actually the cousin <clears throat> of Queen Esther. And in this scripture that I just read, um, Haman decrees that all the Jews should be destroyed. Do we see a modern day parallel here? Um, currently, <clears throat> Iran, you know, just recently this past weekend attacked um israel and um there's portions of iran in the arab world and i'm not saying all not all not all not all but there is a portion of um the arab states where some of their believers want to destroy and annihilate the jews okay and that's just a fact and again, I'm not saying that all Muslims um, or all Ar Arabian people want to annihilate the Jews, but there is a portion of them that want to annihilate the Jews, okay? Um, and this thought process has never left, like truly left Israel's enemies, you know? And I've been thinking a lot about this, you know, you, you can't help but not to. I mean, it's one of the major, you know, world stories that's playing out on an international global level um 
and I think about it. And of course, as a Christian, I think about what all this means in regards to the Bible. And tonight I hope to like, give, like I said, some framing of all of this. And this is where I realize and completely understand that this could be controversial. Um, this could be very upsetting to people. And I want to touch on this. This has been irritating me when it comes to um, things we're seeing in the news and things we're seeing with like people who are pro-Palestine and, and want the Jews to um, stop attacking Hamas. Um, I get very upset and frustrated. I know that the enemy is twisting this. And by enemy, I mean the devil. Um, the enemy wants to twist this, okay? But one thing that I want to point out in this Palestinian-Israeli conflict is sometimes I see the Palestinian protesters have signs saying stop geno genocide, okay? Um, I find this very ironic for two reasons. And just before I touch on those, um, the definition of genocide is the, the deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or group. Now, last time I checked, um, the Jews are not trying to annihilate every single Palestinian. Okay. And here's where the irony comes in. Some uh, Muslims and people of the Islamic faith, not all, not all, not all, but the far right conservatives ones, there are a portion of them that want to commit genocide on the Jews. Okay. So I find that ironic. Archmages, one thing I know for sure is we are all God's children and I pray that blood stop spilling. I, I totally, I'm with you a hundred percent, but, um, you know, I've been studying this a little more in depth lately. And though we all have an ideal for world peace and all that, we have to be sober minded and objective and ask ourselves like in the history of the world, since the beginning till now, has there ever been world peace? You know, I, I don't know for sure. I'm not a historian, but I don't know that if there's ever been a time in the history of humanity that there wasn't some kind of war going on somewhere between two groups or more, right? This is, this is the state of a fallen world with sin and sinful men and women, me the first one to confess and admit I'm a sinner. Okay. So tonight's Bible study, I feel like it's like, I'm. Um, what's that saying? You know, uh, don't shoot the messenger. I'm going to cover a few things and I'm going to try to be as objective as I can. Um, because this is a very hot button issue, but yeah, back to, back to the genocide thing. I don't think it's fair that the Palestinians are saying like, this is a genocide. Um, a true genocide would be the Jews saying we're going to kill every Palestinian. And our aim, you know, is that from what I've heard, Israel's justification is they did this horrific attack on us on October 7th in which they did kill babies and children. Right. And I'm just saying this objectively, Israel is saying, you know, we can't stand for this. <clears throat> we have the right to attack back and defend ourselves. Archimedes, I don't think there could be world peace if we aren't united, but the way we are being forced to unite is not the way. There is a way, but this, whatever it is, ain't it, you know? But we are all in God's hands, and we will be guided to where we are meant to be taken. Amen. And I agree. Um, and ultimately we won't get into it, but I think there is going to be some great uniting eventually. And I don't know if it'll be in our lifetime, but it will be the antichrist, a false Christ who comes. The Bible says he'll, he will be saying peace, peace. Okay. We won't get into that tonight. And, um, this is another controversial thing, but I've said this before, but we're all children of God in the sense that we all 
ultimately came from God. Every human that's ever lived was created and made because of God. God has the power of life and death, right? But there are scriptures in the Bible that, that say, you know, if you don't follow God and Jesus, you are not a child of God in that sense. So if you reject Christ, you're not a child of God in that sense. And I don't mean this judgmentally, and I don't mean this as if I'm more, um, I'm better than anyone or I'm self-righteous. And cause again, I will be the first to admit I'm a sinner and I've committed some awful sins throughout my lifetime and my struggle with, um, weed, booze, and sex. Again, those are my three weaknesses, if you want to say, and they've led to some awful things in my life. Right. Um, but if you reject Christ and you're against God, you know, that is the spirit of the Antichrist. You might not be the famous Antichrist talked of in the Bible, but you have the spirit of the Antichrist. And until you accept Jesus and his sacrifice, you are at en enmity with God. You're an enemy of God, whether you believe that or not. You know, some, again, a flat out Satanist does believe in, in God and the devil and they're against God. And again, not all, not all, not all. Some Satanists aren't um, spiritual, all right? But some Satanists worship Satan, okay? And they think that God's the quote-unquote bad guy and Satan is the good guy. And there are people that believe that in this world. And not every Satanist believes that, but some do. I'm exposing it tonight. You're like, some of us already knew that, Steve. But, um... Uh, this means a lot to me. Um, these are things I've struggled with with my whole life, and I want to relay this, you know, through my Twitch and through my YouTube videos. Um, and it's really heavy on my heart, and I feel really nervous right now. And I take that as a good sign, though, in a way, ironically. Um, so I just wanted to clear up that genocide thing. Um, again, the reason why it's ironic is there is a portion of Islamists who would gladly want to commit genocide on the Jews. The definition, the deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or group. Remember, I don't know if you've seen this in, new, in the news, there's a saying that even some of the protesters in America have been chanting at times where they say from the river to the sea. And that's a, that's a saying that stands for annihilating and killing all the Jews in Israel. It's a reference from the Jordan River to the Black Sea, I believe. I may be wrong there, but whatever sea borders Israel and the Jordan River, that saying, it sounds cute, just on a glance, if you don't know what it means, from the river to the sea, it stands for killing every Jew, man, woman, and child that live between the river and the sea. That's genocide, okay? That's saying we were going to wipe out this whole nation right here. That's the definition of genocide. So I know the enemies, <laughs> this is what the enemy does. Again, by the enemy, I mean ultimately the devil. The devil flips it. The people who would commit genocide <laughs> are the ones claiming that Israel is committing genocide. And I don't believe that. I do believe that Israel wants, wants to wipe out Hamas, um, <clears throat> you know, and they're labeled by the broader global world as terrorists in a very general sense. Now, obviously, if you believe in, in that, in your a fundamental is Muslim, you obviously don't think you're a terrorist, right? You think you're carrying out God's will through that. Um, but I'm talking about the, the secular worldview of what it is. They are considered by, you know, many nations to be a terrorist group. And Israel has said, like, that attack, you guys went too far. You know what I mean? You came into our nation. And remember, guys, they k killed civilians, children, women, unarmed people. You know, it w that's how terrorism works. It's one thing for two sides to say we're going to war and we're sending our able-bodied men with weapons and we're going to fight. Okay. 
that's very different than a sneak attack where you sneak into the country and kill unarmed civilians, all right? And I want, you'll see as we go, but I'm going to bring up some other stuff. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. No one who does bad often thinks they're in the wrong. A lot of bad has been done in the name of, go in, of good. Amen, Archmages. And I, I touch on this even a little bit more. This whole notion is coming up in my notes, but, and we're, we'll get there. And I'm hoping this all connects, you know, and that whoever listens or sees the YouTube video walks away with a, if with new knowledge of this and, and how to view it, you know, but it's totally true. And this is the importance of God and scripture. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. You either believe that or you don't. And being a follower of Christ, <clears throat> we're in this battle to do the right thing. The Bible says our spirits are at war with our flesh. Our spirit wants to do the right thing, but our flesh wants to sin, right? And think of that just on the surface level of how like a lot of sins are, are connected to your flesh, like overeating is a sin, right? And that's literally like a physical act of putting food, too much food, too much bad food in your body. Um, having sex outside of marriage or being a sex addict, that's literally the flesh. I don't know how much more fleshly you can get, right? That's like two intimate body parts, flesh touching. Um, it's like this carnal appetite that that we have as humans, but the spirit is deeper than the flesh and it wants to override that, you know, and it wants to overcome that because we know in our hearts, there's a better way. Um, so we're at war with these conflicting things as believers and it's a battle and the battles won because of what Jesus did, but we have the responsibility now to walk and follow. Okay. Um, but this is why it's important to stand on the word of God, because no matter what we feel, and even when we mess up, we fall back on that. This is the right thing. And sometimes my life and the things I'm doing in my life aren't matching up with this. Right. And this is the thing that guides you on the days you don't feel, quote unquote, feel like doing the right thing as you grow and mature in Christ you override that and you decide, I, you know what, today, Lord, I might not feel like doing the right thing, whether it be something big or small, whether it be just simply doing your 15 minutes of quiet time before you start the day. Your flesh is already at war. Even in that little example, your flesh is like, eh, it's okay. God already knows what you're going to pray. And oh, the Bible doesn't help that much. And that's not going to stop uh, the bills from coming. You know, there's so many temptations to not sit down for 15 minutes and pray and read the Bible. And then all the way to bigger, more, you know, things that have dramatic consequences. Um, a man contemplating committing adultery on his wife, a woman contemplating committing adultery on her husband, um, wanting to take the easy way out at work, wanting to throw somebody under the bus at work so that you don't, you know, whatever, a million different sins, big and small, that you can categorize this in that we struggle with. And on those days that you're not feeling it, this is where faith comes in and you say, you know what? I don't feel like it, but I'm going to do it, right? I much rather not read my Bible this morning, but it's the right thing to do. And it's what God wants from me, you know, and it's a really good uh, point of view to have. It, it's actually very encouraging guys when you're in those moments of like, I'm confused and I'm torn. You just fall back on what's right, you know, and that's where faith starts coming in into your life. Um, and then, okay, back to this passage. So we're talking about Esther 3, 1 through 8. Another thing to get from this is in this passage, we see Haman's obsession. So Haman is mad at Mordecai because Mordecai isn't willing to bow down to him and pay him homage. All right. And I don't know the exact reasons why Mordecai doesn't do this. But we can surmise from the text and the way this is written that um, if Mordecai is a, um, a Jew, you know, and has his own belief and faith, which is different from um, from the, different from Haman and King Assyrius, um, it might be not in his religion to bow down to him. Um, and it might even be something 
pettier than that and he just doesn't want to or a combination of the two right so we have two very different cultures meeting up in this right and this bothers Haman and as we read the book and as we saw in the outline of the story it drives Haman to not only want to to kill Mordecai he takes it further and wants to kill all the Jews okay and this is the reason why I'm touching on the modern day conflict this has been going on for thousands of years that people have come up against the Jewish people going all the way to ancient times and more recently what happened with Hitler and the Jews, right? It is no coincidence. The nation of Israel will always be under attack. And in the last days, in the last days, as we approach the end times, you know, and we're going to touch on this too, but the battle of Gog and Magog is, is a prophecy um, in which God will deliver the Jews from all the surrounding nations that come against it. Okay. And yeah, we're, I'm going to show you how this connects to us as individual believers living in America or C Canada, like where Archmages is from, or anybody who watches this, you're thinking, well, what does this have to do to me? Do with me? I know there's got to be a ton of Christians ultimately thinking, unless they know their Bible really well, they're thinking, what does this have to do with me? Right? I have to go to work at the Foot Locker tomorrow or whatever. I'm dating myself, dude. Is the Foot Locker even still a store? But you know what I'm saying? It's like, how does this connect to my life in America as a Christian? You're, you're going to see. Um, but in this passage, again, we see Haman's obsession. This should be a lesson to all of us in whatever we may obsess about in our lives. We can all get obsessed about all kinds of things. Of course, our sin can become an obsession. An obsession reflects idol worship, which is going against one of the Ten Commandments. You know, there should be nothing more important in our lives than God. And there's a million idols competing for that attention. Okay. In the ancient Jewish times, it was literally the choice of other pagan religions where they would worship idols. Literally. You know what I mean? Physical, literal idols, wooden images, carved images. And they're, they're, they're praying to these false gods, which are really no gods at all. You know, gods with the lowercase g. Um, they're, they're pursuing these things. Now, a lot of us in this modern day and day and age, we don't worship idols like that. Some people do. Again, some people still do. But I would say like in my life in general, I don't meet people that I know who bow down and pray to an idol. I do know a lot of people who care about money, uh, relationships with other people, uh, materialism, addiction, um, sex those all are all things that come before God in people's lives. And these things erode our spiritual health and they erode our relationship with God. And ultimately in the end, they don't deliver on what they promise they're going to deliver. I hate to break it to you guys. Sin promises a lot and it, it delivers the complete opposite of that. You know, sin promises happiness, peace, joy, contentment. It'll make you feel good. It'll make you feel better. It'll make you feel at peace. And the insidious thing about it is it does the exact opposite. It leaves you less at peace. It leaves you less content. It leaves you broken. It leaves you feeling unfulfilled. So this is the great lie that Satan and our own minds play on us. And you've heard this before. God's such a, a buzzkill. God has too many rules. As I follow the Lord more, there is freedom, contentment, joy, and peace in those rules. I promise that firsthand testimony experience. What seems to our fleshly sinful side is, oh, that's a prison. I don't want to, you know what I mean? I don't want to be accountable to these rules and regulations. We, I want to be free and fun and do my own thing. Sin never is going to let you be free and fun and do your own thing. I promise you. I promise you that. Like take it from a 42 year old guy who's committed a lot of messed up sins in his life. Your sin is not going to deliver on what it promises. And it might not be tomorrow and it might not be in a month, but in the end, sin will have its way with you and it will leave you broken.